Uh, well, thank you, um, and I'm delighted to see so many people coming to Khmer, and um, delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you about my recent book. Now, this, my most recent book, is really an extension or kind of wrapping up of the work I've done previously. Uh, for many years, this bit about truly difficult mothers has uh, remained at the margins of my research. For many years, I did observe mothers and teenage daughters in particularly interacting with each other and reflecting on their relationships. Um, I also looked at sons and daughters on the cusp of adulthood and the importance of mothers in their lives. And in two decades of research, I have yet to meet someone whose mother, for better or for worse, has not played a central role in development. But such powerful attachments are not easy to negotiate, particularly during those teenage and early adult years when uh, sons and daughters are searching out their identities. They don't necessarily need to define straight away who they are, but they're really probing for a sense of possibility of who they might become. And teens, particularly teenage daughters, um, test out different personae on their mothers. They want to get a mother's reaction to these various possibilities. And sometimes they do this by shocking them into a new awareness of how they've changed probably how they've changed from the little child, the little girl, the mother thinks she knows. And they often do this by being difficult, by generating tension, by quarreling. And um, mothers and their children engage in more arguments, many more arguments than fathers and their children. And during the teenage years, um, the... Uh, arguments are indeed very, very common. So um, among, between mothers and daughters, a daughter and a teenage mother have some kind of spat lasting about 15 minutes every two and a half days. For adolescent boys, um, it's more spread out and it's briefer. It's about uh, one conflict every four days and their conflicts only last about six minutes. So you can see why I have much richer material about mothers and their teenage daughters. Uh, but nonetheless, there still is quite a lot of volatility uh, with sons as well. But at the same time, uh, most teenagers describe the relationship with a mother as close and supportive, and above all, they say it's important. But mothers themselves may not be aware of this. They may not experience it in this way. And they're often baffled by the hostility that can leap out of nowhere. And, you know, I have many mothers talking to me. I could have, I have, a, I have a wealth of quotes, but I'll just give you one. Judith says that her once affectionate daughter is now at 14, always surly and that she has now porcupine-like spines that bristle when I get near her. And she feels that in the eyes of her daughter, she can say nothing right. She says, as soon as I open my mouth, she criticizes me. It can be even something very neutral. I ask her whether she wants toast, and she says, toast? That's so stupid. You should know I don't <laughs> like toast. Well, you know, we've all been there. To say something innocent and friendly and find you've caused offense, to try to be helpful and be told you're interfering, to show affection and discover you're making a nuisance of yourself, to try to praise someone and then be told you're incapable of judgment. Well, these are the glitches in mother-child exchanges that sometimes lead mothers to believe that it's better to say nothing, that your child thinks you would be better off without you, without you saying anything, perhaps even if you disappeared. But in fact, teenagers, and particularly teenage daughters, 
are asked what do they like doing most with their mothers, and they say they like talking. That's what they like doing best. <laughs> now, they will, of course, criticize a mother for what she says and complain about what she does, but such criticisms and complaints are generally attempts to influence a mother's views, to remind her that she cannot predict what her daughter thinks and feels, that she's got to make an effort to get to know her. And throughout their lives, daughters want to maintain a close relationship with a mother, but they also want to monitor it and influence its terms. And to do this, they need a mother's ear. They need her to notice them and respond to what they say and do. So the significance of a mother's intense responsiveness to a child has been marked in the early years of development, particularly in infancy and early childhood. But it's continued and transformed importance from the teenage years and into and throughout adulthood is often ignored. Now, of course, teens sometimes disguise their passionate need for a mother, and they do so with aloof, arch, or barbed manner. And among friends, uh, in particular girls and even women, have a culture of swapping stories about their difficult mothers and claim to have the most annoying mother in the world. But I've also noticed that in the presence of a mother, they keep a close eye on her as a person of great significance to them. They're acutely aware of her words and gestures. When they give her information or ask a question, they want her full attention. And when they do not get the recognition or understanding they crave, they complain a mother is not listening or not understanding. And these accusations in the interpersonal arena are very serious. Not listening, failing to understand in this context means not engaging with or not caring about the thoughts and feelings that are of supreme importance to the daughter and what she is trying to convey. And if a girl thinks her mother doesn't listen, she'll shout to make her hear. Now, um, I've looked, as I say, at a lot of mother-daughter quarrels, and I've uh, done a close reading of them, almost as the way a critic would of a play, of a, of a script of a play, to see what is going on, what are the motives, what are the aims. And what I found is that um, these arguments, even when they seem to be about something very specific and um, you know, very urgent, such as curfews, uh, boyfriends, uh, housework, schoolwork, they're actually embedded in profound relational themes about connection, recognition, and respect. Um, and at the same time, uh, mothers themselves tend to focus on the practical issue. You know, is, is my daughter going to destroy herself? Is she putting herself at risk? And in the sh course of a few short years, teens themselves are very, very impressed with how much they've learned, their independence, their capacity to reflect and to make their own decisions. But and they're rightly impressed by that, but parents are rightly wary of a teen's shortfall, particularly in the ability to gauge risk, to plan ahead, and to control their impulses. Over the past 10 or 15 years, um, the ability uh, psychologists have to look at functional magnetic resonance images of the brain show very distinctive um, structural and functional differences in the teenage brain. And it's in those areas that um, that would enable one to have impulse control and plan ahead. Those areas are particularly challenged during the teenage years. So there is a great deal to negotiate. And mothers and teens who never fight, never find one another difficult, are rare. And I would say rarely are they happier or closer than mothers and teens who do quarrel. 
because in avoiding arguments, mother and child may forego getting to know one another. They may be at peace because they silence their own feelings and give up on the genuine dynamic relationship. So more important than keeping peace is fighting well, keying into the information a son or daughter is giving about how they've changed and noting the steps they're taking to explain themselves and to alter or update this valuable relationship. Now, most mothers are good enough at doing this difficult task. They're not only fit for purpose, but they do so well by their children that these children develop very high expectations of them, and those high expectations can generate more conflict because when a mother less than perfectly meets their needs, they complain. But such complaints are warmed by the hope that this slow learning mother will eventually learn to see, appreciate, and understand this child. So for the most part, complaints and criticisms about difficult mothers are embedded in efforts to renew and revitalize the relationship. Yet, about 20% of the relationships in my studies over uh, decades are very different from this vital rough and tumble. They are persistently unsatisfactory. They seem both rigid and fragile. I mean, they won't budge, but on the other hand, they might break. And they leave no room for adjustment. They seem to forbid negotiation. And though these uncomfortable relationships occur only in a minority of cases, for these sons and daughters, you know, be they children, be they adults, the experience is raw and powerful, and it warrants attention. And it is these persistently difficult, rigid relationships that I focus on in my recent book, Difficult Mothers. But the very term difficult mothers arouses unease. And often the unease leads to anger and protest. After all, why am I focusing on mothers? Is this fair? Isn't this another example of blaming mothers for everything? And what about fathers? Aren't they equally responsible? And what about grandparents, siblings, friends, neighbors, teachers, all have the potential to interact with and shape a child? Don't children form multiple attachments that moderate their development and contribute to their resilience or not? And my answer is, of course. But the mother-child bond is often called a foundational relationship, and for good reason. There is no getting away from the special impact a mother is highly likely to have on a child. In all observed cultures, in all recorded times, human infants engage intimately with the people who care for them. I mean, the fact is that human infants are born prematurely. They really need an enormous amount of input from the more competent adults. And the parent who takes the most prominent role in inducting an infant into the interpersonal world is usually, not always, but usually a mother. And the special nature of this bond has been of great interest to uh, researchers, to psychologists over the past century. Um, in the beginning, you know, the first supposition was that anatomy is destiny. They were focusing on biology, uh, the fact that you were giving birth, that was the main theme about this foundational relationship. Then there were attempts to sort of fine tune this and see what exactly in this relationship was the focus of uh, such attachment. And for some, it was thought to be breastfeeding, indeed, um, that you know, this kind of love was a kind of cupboard love. 
And this notion was challenged uh, by research in the 1950s, uh, where rhesus, infant rhesus monkeys were put in an environment where they had um, two maternal models. One was a source of food, and the other was a cuddly object. And it was observed over and over that the infant monkey, when under stress, when needing some kind of reassurance, when might exhibit attachment behavior, went to the cuddly model, not to the uh, model that was a source of food. And that really challenged the notion that this attachment was basically cupboard love, had, uh, you know, was primarily a result of um, nursing. Um, and so uh, with this research about the, the, you know, touch, um, softness, cuddliness was so important, a lot of researchers were very interested in um, the effect of touch and um, a consequence of the release of the, what's called the bonding hormone oxytocin, where in fact smell, unconscious perception of smell also plays a role. And all of these things, of course, are related to the, and play into the, um, that foundational bond. But what is most fascinating to me is the psychological intimacy, how each learns about the inner life of the other. Now, a mother and baby lock together in a mutual gaze, each looking back at the other. And this process is sometimes referred to as I love, love that arises from gazing or observing the other's face and finding meanings in facial expressions. And this early prolonged eye can contact is so important to the growing human brain that it seems evolution has left nothing to chance. And there's a very primitive uh, brainstem reflex that ensures the baby turns to look at the mother's face. And the instinct that a mother has to hold the baby on her left side was once thought to be a matter of the uh, mother's heartbeat, that um, in such a holding position, the baby heard that gentle heartbeat and that was a reminder of the womb noises and that was very soothing. Current understanding is that this in instinctive placement is linked to the fact that the left side of the body is wired to the right side of the brain. And such a holding position facilitates right hemisphere to right hemisphere stimulation. And it's the right hemisphere, that part of the brain, that specializes in communication and connection. So as she cradles her baby on her left side, she has a hotline to the infant's right brain. And it's also interesting that the infant's behavior um, actually stimulates the mother's right brain. It's actually both brains, mothers and babies, that are affected by this interaction. So as she engages with her infant, a mother's brain too is stimulated to new growth and learning, and that increases her ability to pick up cues from her infant. But this isn't gendered. You know, if a father, um, any other adult, holds a baby and attends, that, that learning also takes place. But it is the newborn's brain that undergoes the most remarkable growth spurt at this time. So during the first 18 months of life, the pathways for social and emotional learning grow and multiply. And babies learn very quickly about complex emotional expressions. So within the first nine months of life, babies can tell the difference between expressions of happiness and sadness and anger. So for example, they can recognize that a happy looking face with a smile and crinkly eyes goes with a chirp of a happy tone of voice. And just two weeks ago, there was an article published in Psychological Science that showed that babies as young as six months old, even when they're asleep, register the difference between angry tones of voice and neutral tones of voice. And it's during this time, too, that they start to build up the 
very complex conceptual scaffold in which we think about, they can think about themselves and other people as having inner feelings and emotions and needs that can be expressed by their physical selves and understood by others. And this process begins with human interaction. You know, when, you, when a baby feels pain or distress, you can see his entire body overwhelmed by these feelings. His chest heaves, his legs kick, his arms tense. And when a mother responds, not by crying herself, but with an expression of interest and concern, you know, composing her face in an imitation of some features of distress. It's usually the furrowed brow and exaggerated frown. Um, she partly mirrors the baby's mental state, but she also transforms it. In this often automatic, but nonetheless very sophisticated version of imitation, she makes it clear that by mirroring her or imitating her baby's feelings, she's not expressing the same feelings herself. She's looking into her child's. And this complex response is called marked mirroring. This transforms an infant's experience into a concept about a mental state. She shows the infant that he has feelings and lives among other people who also have feelings and a separate mental life of their own. And these separate people can connect to him and understand his inner states. So the infant is then able to take the very first steps towards the ability to mentalize, that is, reflect on his own thoughts and feelings and those of others. Because his mother has shown him that his internal world can be understood and that others are willing to help him regulate fear, pain, hunger, and other distress. So what is called affect regulation, or learning how to manage feelings, is now seen as the primary task, the primary developmental task of the first two years of life. And there's the experience of moving with a caregiver's help from that overwhelming distress where you see, you know, the infant just overwhelmed by even momentary discomfort, moving from that state to a kind of calm with the parent soothing. And this is called rupture and repair. This, these repeated experiences called rupture and repair. And it plays a very important role in forming neural networks to allow us to buffer stress, to see that we're not going to die when something goes wrong. And the newborn initially has to borrow or draw upon the emotional control of the caregiver to, in order to under, experience the ebb and flow of emotions. But when they borrow this, they learn the first steps in emotion management or affect regulation, as it's often referred to. And our early interactions with our primary caregiver, who tends to be our mother, shape the circuits of the infant brain, the circuits that are used to understand and manage our own emotions and to read other people's thoughts and feelings. And long after the complex structures that form our social and emotional brain have developed the, you know, all the things we need to get through the day as interactive beings, we continue to seek responsiveness from a mother. We seldom cease to care what a mother thinks of us. So when we experience a mother dif as difficult, we do so in this context when we see how our sense of self is developed in relationship with her, I think it's easier to understand why, when she is difficult, we may feel that we are losing our minds. So what is a difficult mother? I've said that most good enough mothers are sometimes difficult, but then there are 20% of cases in which I think they really are difficult. What is that? Well, in puzzling over this, I found that the the best definition of a difficult mother is someone who presents her child with a relational dilemma. 
And that dilemma is either develop mechanisms and skills to maintain a relationship with me on my terms or suffer disapproval, my disapproval, my ridicule, or my rejection. In other words, the condition set for the relationship is not mutuality, it's silence and compliance. It's up to you, the child, to silence thoughts that do not comply with mine, to silence feelings that defy my needs, to silence impulses and goals that may be cons inconsistent with my expectations. And just another reminder of why in developmental terms this dilemma is so difficult, um, as mother and child interact, their mutual focus is so intricately coordinated that it has been described as an elaborate flowing dance. I mean, there, there are wonderful videos showing gaze, expression, gesture, all our um, illicit very specific responses. And you can even see babies and very young children take time out from this intense relational stimulation as they need to take a breather and how a mother herself tends to respect this um, need to take time out. And so intricate is this that um, when there is the normal face-to-face -face interaction between child and caregiver is broken, uh, when a mother's face becomes frozen, still, or unresponsive, within minutes, the baby becomes intensely distressed. So the mother's still there. It isn't that she's absent, but she just has a frozen, still face. And even at the age of two months, a baby will protest by wriggling, fretting, and bellowing. And it takes uh, quite a long time to soothe a baby who has experienced this interruption in the relational conversation. And anyone who wants to see um, some of the uh, films in which these studies are based, there is the reference. And I think this is a good model of a difficult mother later on. A difficult mother refuses to engage in a reciprocal conversation and demands silence, compliance, and a one-way responsiveness. And where um, this relational dilemma is rigidly and persistently enforced, you get a difficult relationship. And in trying to think about this further and the different contexts in which this occurs, I found that there were, broadly speaking, five different patterns for enforcing this relational silence. And the first is anger. Well, as a mother myself, I'm well aware that parental anger is unavoidable. And as a mother and a psychologist, I have good evidence that you know outbursts from time to time don't damage a relationship. As I've said, quarrels and bust-ups are part of the emotional weather of family life. But prolonged and persistent exposure to a parent's anger creates a stressful atmosphere in which a child lives in a constant state of anxiety. So I'm not talking about transient anger. This isn't anger about something. And this isn't tactical anger. You know when you shout because you are, want to signal danger. You know, don't touch that. Get out of the road. This is anger that is volatile, that is unpredictable. And even when it's not activated, it affects the entire relationship. And such anger is not only unpleasant. For a very young child, prolonged stress is really toxic to the developing brain because that kind of stress actually slows the growth of neural pathways that are so important to affect regulation to mentalization, the neural pathways that we use to understand and regulate our feelings. And it also reduces the plasticity of the brain. The plasticity of the brain is the adaptability of the brain, uh, the capacity of the brain to learn. So when you um, 
when children grow up in this very stressful environment, they're less able to learn self-management techniques even later on. And adult sons and daughters often talk about a really deep primitive panic that they feel in face of a mother's anger. And this goes back to a remembering context in which they, as very young children, couldn't process this anger and felt that her anger uh, was an abandonment signal, and they still have that association. The um, next um, pattern of difficulty, again, is problematic control. Surely all children need a parent to exert control and to teach them self-control. But the control of a difficult mother is really very different. In this sense, control is a kind of rejection of their natural impulses and a message of self-distrust. So in a good enough relationship, there will be battles over control. But in a difficult relationship, control rests on the precept of self-distrust. And it's what the psychoanalyst Alice Miller calls poisonous pedagogy. What the mother is doing is teaching a child that it's more important for her to have control over the child because the child's own preferences and thoughts and wishes are bad or defective or dangerous, or in some cases, they're labeled evil. Now, there's also um, narcissism in um, parenting, and I have really resisted this label for some time because there's also much said about um, the narcissistic mother. In fact, in terms of a narcissistic personality, it's much more common in men than in women, but it does exist. It is problematic when it does, and so I'm going to talk about it. In um, ordinary terms, when we say someone's a narcissist, we tend to mean he or she has a big ego. In psychological terms, a narcissist has a very, very fragile ego. It always seems as though it's about to fall apart, and that person needs constant reassurance to keep just the sense of self together and demands adoration and compliance for a child. Now, you can see that this may be more problematic at some phases of a child's life than at others. When a child is four, he or she may be very ready and willing to reflect a mother at twice or thrice her natural size. But at age 14, when children develop by challenging a parent, this can trigger a highly uncomfortable and punitive relationship. And um, at any time when a mother is narcissistic, that relationship is such that if the child wants to make her own decisions and go her own way and have her own views, then the parent is likely to see this as a betrayal. So that's a great um, source of guilt. The um, next style of difficulty is envy. And again, maternal envy, which had a high profile of discussion in the 1970s um, is something I'm not comfortable, I mean, I, I want to flag it is not common, and I've written elsewhere that, you know, um, there was a time when psychologists thought maternal envy was very common. Helen Deutsch uh, wrote about this and thought it was a very common theme uh, between mothers and adolescent daughters. I've written elsewhere that I think it's rare. But it does emerge in the, these minority of cases as a distinct pattern of difficulty. And a parent's envy betrays the most basic terms of the parent-child contract. I mean, that contract is, I'm going, to see, I'm going to take pleasure in seeing you thrive. But an envious mother resents her child's positive development. And since envy is one of the most unpleasant feelings in the uh, register of human emotions, an envious mother is almost always unaware of her envy, or she will deny 
or disguise it with a range of other explanations. You know, you think too much of yourself. Um, it's my job to help you be realistic. Your hopes are too high. I don't want you to be disappointed. And what envy does is turn the good <coughs> things into bad things. I mean, even a child's pleasure, achievement, happiness, these things become bad things. And that, of course, is immensely confusing. The last pattern is uh, emotional neglect. Now, we all know when we talk about uh, parents, friends, um, any support network, being there is one of the most important things that one can do. And being there doesn't mean being there physically. I am certainly not talking about <coughs> women who go out to work versus women who stay at home. Being there suggests a flow of access and interest. It suggests capability of focus and support. And the epitome of not being there for a child isn't physical absence, it's emotional absence, where there's no resonance, no responsiveness, no mutuality. And uh, people who have experienced a mother's emotional absence sometimes talk about a ghostly sense of her being there and being dead, and sometimes have an internalized um, dead mother image. And the most common causes of a mother's emotional absence are drug or alcohol abuse or depression. And that's one reason why maternal depression, particularly postnatal depression, is such a serious issue for children as well as, of course, for the mother. So at any age, Sons and daughters depend on a mother's genuine willingness to understand them, at least to try to understand them, to make an effort. And a difficult mother takes ownership of a child's own stories and perspective, and she condemns, limits, and distorts them. And this presents a dilemma. Forgo your own voice and maintain the significant relationship, or Go ahead, try to maintain your own voice, but then in consequence, suffer contempt, criticism, and ridicule. Now, it's easy enough to see what negative results uh, the experience of um, a difficult relationship might have. Self-doubt. Sometimes people talk about an internalized, self-punishing voice fear of exposure, shyness, uncertainty, all sorts of things. But it's important to note that difficult relationships do not necessarily end in defeat. First of all, different children have different genetic tolerances for what counts as difficult. Some children have what is called the orchid gene, and this is a name given to a variation of the gene, the serotonin transporter gene, that influences how vulnerable we are to certain stressful circumstances. And a child who carries this variant gene is likely to be very creative and imaginative and sensitive, but also hypervigilant to stress. So may have a brother or sister who doesn't carry this gene variant, that brother or sister may barely notice the conditions that put their sibling on level five alert. In addition, um, I found that people often acquire skills in the process of dealing with a difficult mother. And these skills include patience, diplomacy, tolerance. And there's also opportunity for change. I mean, a difficult mother is not a cut and dried characteristic. A mother may be difficult at one period of her life or during one phase of a child's life and not at another. A child may have a difficult mother and may have a sibling with the same mother who doesn't have a difficult mother because it's a feature of the relationship, not always of a person. Also, some children are very proactive in finding other people to satisfy their needs for a deep relational conversation. Some will inhabit a fiercely private world in which they can 
develop self-knowledge and self-trust. But whether we are 5, 15, or 50, we're likely to seek resonance with a mother and value our ability to speak in her presence and for her to hear us. But when we persistently meet with anger, control, envy, or neglect, we miss out on the resonance that so many sons and daughters find in engaging in heated, passionate, sometimes difficult and sometimes enjoyable conversations with a good enough mother. And that poses a special challenge to well-being. And I think understanding and conceptualizing this difficulty may help meet this challenge. And that's the purpose of my research. Thank you.